everybody keeps saying white box, but it was really kind of a wood grainy color. Let's talk about it tonight on the Old Dragoon. Welcome back to the Old Dragoon. Tonight, we're going to be delving into the first book of the first version of Dungeons & Dragons. Now, the channel started with the 1983 Beck Me rules, the basic expert companion Masters Immortals rules with the uh, Larry Elmore covers and Frank Mincer's editing. That's where I started. But now we're going to go all the way back to the beginning and chronologically explore D&D going forward. So tonight we're going to take a look at Men and Magic, the first book in the Dungeons & Dragons box. And uh, as I was joking about in the cold open, a lot of people use the phrase white box today. White box, it's the white box. The original boxes, because they were inexpensive, were plain wood grain boxes that had the D&D &D label affixed to the top. All of that was done at Don Kay's house, basically by family members, and that was the original printing of D&D. &D. If you really want to get down into the nitty grit of how the game came to pass, there's some wonderful books out there to take a look at. And I've recently become aware of a podcast called When We Were Wizards, and I highly, highly recommend it. All right, so this is the cover of original Dungeons and Dragons as it appeared in 1974. This is the cover of the official scan version that you will get today. The artwork has been changed and, and updated to avoid some copyright issues that happened with the art, uh, some of which was very thinly uh, traced and or embellished but the wood grain box became the white box. Later printings of the original books, which were sometimes known as the collector's edition, did come in a white box, and those are much more common to find than the wood grain box versions. Those will cost you a pretty penny. Not that the white boxes are cheap these days. But a lot of the retro clones that we see out there refer to the phrase white box. And when people say that, they generally mean 0 e the wood grain box. I, I know I've gotten corrected by Tim Cask on that. Uh, yes, I know, Tim, it is a wood grain box, and I will try to remember the difference. So let's take a look at this book and see what's inside it. Last time we looked at D&D, &D, we went to Chainmail, which was the tabletop war game that preceded and was used as a component of this version of D&D. &D. So this is where Dungeons & Dragons proper actually began, but Chainmail is a parallel to this and was intended to be used as part of Dungeons & Dragons. Now, whether or not that was common depends on who you ask. I am told by some of the elder attendees of North Texas RPG Con that Gary Gygax himself tended to just use the D20 resolution system that we're familiar with today or an early ancestor thereof so let's take a look so here is the first booklet now these were saddle stapled and they had a cardstock cover the original printings had a textured cardstock cover that i think is rather cool but the later printings just used plain cardstock and here we go with book one, Men and Magic, by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson. Dedicated to fantasy wargamers. And you'll notice Wizards of the Coast put their little logo in there for the official reprints. So there was an index, even though the book is only a 36-page affair. Now here in the foreword, you'll see something that is very interesting to the modern reader. Actually, several things. Gary Gygax wrote this forward in 1973. And I love that uh, 
he uses the European slash military date format, 1 November 1973. I've been doing that myself ever since high school, thanks to ROTC and later service in the State Guard. So I don't know why. It warms my little heart. I think we Americans are weird putting the month first. You know, medium size unit, small unit, big unit. No, this is small unit, medium, big, 1 November. Anyway, I'm getting off case. In this short forward, Gary mentions several things that are of interest to someone exploring Dungeons and Dragons from a historical perspective. He mentions the Twin Cities Game Club. That is where the role-playing component of Dungeons and Dragons got its start with the Blackmore games. The two Daves, Dave Arneson and Dave Wesley. He talks about the Great Kingdom, the Egg of Coot. All of these things were associated with the original Blackmore campaign. He mentions how Dave used chainmail to sort of adjudicate how combat would work in Blackmore. And as you read on, you will see that at the time that this first version of D&D was finally published, Blackmore and Greyhawk were already well-developed campaigns running in Lake Geneva and the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. So even before the game hit the streets, the names Black. Blackmore and Greyhawk were already a thing. They were they already existed. There were already players familiar with them. And then we go into that final paragraph where Gary enumerates some of the inspiration and sort of takes a shot at the war gamers who scoffed at him including fantasy in the chainmail rules. He mentions Edgar Rice Burroughs, Martian Chronicles, he mentions uh, Robert E. Howard's Conan, El Sprague de Camp, Fletcher Pratt, Friends Liber, and not a mention of Tolkien. Now, obviously, there are some Tolkien esque things in Dungeons and Dragons, and some of those are pretty integral to the way people look at D&D today. But according to his own opinions, when people would ask him, these authors listed here were much more on Gary Gygax's mind as he was writing D&D. So here we have the introduction that makes it uh, makes an attempt at explaining exactly what this game was. Again, talking to people who were there when it happened, people who were older than me, I was negative one years old when this version of D&D was published. Uh, I was born in 75. I got the D&D just as fast as I could, but this to me is just as much of a historical delve as it is to many of you. This initial set was notoriously not very good at explaining exactly how to play the game to someone who was not already a war gamer, which prompted uh, Dr. J. Eric Holmes to approach TSR and say, hey, how about I reformat D&D into something a little more beginner friendly? And that's where we got our first basic set in 77. But for now, D&D is explained in terms that make sense to war gamers, but might be kind of inscrutable to someone who's never played a war game before. And remember, this was, for all intents and purposes, the very first role-playing game. So there weren't a lot of people out there that were already familiar with the concept of let's pretend with statistics and dice. This would actually be much more familiar to professional military officers than it would be to people that were used to the popular board games of the time. So, Men and Magic. Book 2 will be Monsters and Treasure. Book 3 will be Underworld and Wilderness Adventures. So now we get a list of the things that you'll need to play Dungeons and Dragons. Now there is something that is missing from this list that did appear in the original printings. And I'm not entirely sure why Wizards of the Coast felt it necessary to remove the reference. Because Wizards of the Coast actually um, is under the same umbrella as Avalon Hill, which was the uh, company that printed the game that's referenced. 
the original text here recommended that players needed a copy of Avalon Hill's Outdoor Survival game. As an aside, Outdoor Survival was designed by Jim Dunnigan, who later went on to found SPI, write several books about the conduct of warfare, um, and famously in college wrote a war game called Up Against the Wall, Motherfucker. Dunnigan ran his own company until it got into financial trouble and was bought by TSR. So whether you're looking at the original writer of Outdoor Survival or the publisher, Avalon Hill, which was purchased by Hasbro, who now owns Wizards of the Coast, there really was no reason for them to take out the reference to Outdoor Survival. Now, what were you supposed to do with Outdoor Survival? So Outdoor Survival was a standalone game. It was a board game that was exactly what it said on the tin. It was about surviving in the out of doors. And in a way, it was almost kind of a proto RPG. You could differentiate your character from others by the things your character was good at. And you would move around the board attempting to find shelter, find food, have enough water, avoid any sort of unpleasant encounters. Well, this map was a ready-made, full-color, sturdy um, location to place early Dungeons & Dragons campaigns. And so the suggestion was that you buy a copy of Outdoor Survival and then pretty much ignore the contents except for the map. So here's a picture of what that map looked like. You can find reproductions out there and copies of Outdoor Survival are actually not that expensive at the time of this recording. I've recently seen a couple go for about $35, $40. And to be honest, if you're not going to play Outdoor Survival, all you really need is a copy that still has the map. The chits that the gamer played with are the parts that are most often lost. So originally... It recommended, hey, you need a copy of this game. You're going to use this map. And it even explained how to use the locations marked on the outdoor survival map as something completely different in Dungeons and Dragons. So you need dice. The original printing told you where you could get the dice. And then, of course, notebook, graph paper, all that sort of thing. Uh, the word campaign is used here for the first time in printed D&D, and that is an outgrowth of military wargaming. Series of military battles are often referred to as a campaign, like in college I studied Jackson's Valley campaign, uh, I studied the Peninsular campaign, the Napoleonic Wars, so campaign is something that comes out of the military context. We talk about characters and the three classes. The classes at this time were fighting men, magic users, and clerics. None of the other classes you're familiar with today existed in these first three books. Those were your choices. Here's some examples of gold piece costs for things. We'll get into the actual equipment costs later. There's an explanation of exactly what magic users and clerics and fighting men can do. Now you'll note at the bottom of this page, it talks about dwarves. Dwarf was not a class as it was in BX and Beckme. You could be a dwarven fighter. The demi-human races modified certain things and gave you certain abilities. One of the things that I get really tickled by is that one of the explicit abilities of the dwarves is to be able to use the plus three magic warhammer. That's a dwarven thing. Elves, halflings, original printings said Hobbit, but after receiving a communication from the Tolkien estate that was changed. Also, Ents became Tree Ants, and a couple of other minor changes. Note at the bottom of page 8, 
anything you can come up with and get your referee to agree to is fair game. Alignment is here in this first version of D&D, &D, and you saw some of this in Chainmail. But it gives you a listing of creatures likely to hew to law, neutrality, and chaos. Some creatures appear on multiple lists, notably men, lycanthropes, orcs. Even as far back as here, changing character classes is discussed. Apparently players asked for it early on in the home campaigns. Now you'll note it says for other than elves. Why? Because elves in this version of D&D, &D, rather than being the hybrid fighter mage they are in BX and Beckme, they get to choose which one they want to be per adventure. They're one or the other. They cannot mix and match abilities at this point, but they can have the flexibility to say, you know what? We're going on this adventure today, delving this dungeon. I think I want to be a magic user this time around. So ability scores are the ones we're used to in a slightly different order, which becomes important because the stats are rolled 3d6 in order. And they're rolled by the referee. The term dungeon master hasn't come into use yet. So you sit down at the table. The referee rolls a set of stats and hands them to you. And then you decide what class you're going to play. I know a lot of players that I've gamed with over the years that would never, ever settle for this. They're far too um, superstitious about who rolls the dice and how the dice will come up. They don't want anybody else rolling their characters for them. But that's the way it was written to be done in this version of D&D. The ability scores are explained at the bottom of this page. Also, how to exchange ability score points to raise prime requisites for the three classes. And Charisma is the first ability score to have bonuses and penalties explained for higher low scores. Charisma affects how many hirelings you can have and how loyal they will be. Below that, we get some other adjustments due to abilities. This table is nowhere near as readable as later versions of the table would be, but it serves its purpose. You see that half of the table is discussions of prime requisites and how they affect earned experience. The major bonus of having a high prime requisite in this version of D&D &D is that you will level faster. Rather than all the numeric bonuses that we're used to in modern versions of D&D, &D, where ability scores are really sort of the king of the character sheet. You want those high ability scores to support your ranged attack, your melee attack, your skill rolls. But way back here, the main function of those prerequ or prime requisites were to get you to the next level faster. And if you think about it, that's a pretty big bonus considering that's when you get your extra hit points, that's when your saving throws and attack rolls presumably improve. So that's a pretty big deal. Constitution can give you one extra hit point. Yay. Um, a medium high constitution, you are able to withstand adversity. That one's in the referee's hands. You have survival ratings for traumatic experiences. This is very much like the system shock rolls of first edition and second edition AD and D. And then dexterity gives you a bonus to missile fire or penalty, but nothing quite yet for defense. There's a quick discussion of languages. And yes, alignment languages were here from the beginning. Those of you who are not old enough to remember, there used to be sort of a half language slang that 
the different alignments had so that they could recognize each other and discuss things from the point of view of their philosophies on life. So you could speak lawful. You could speak chaotic. It's no longer a thing, but it was back then and for quite a while afterwards. We have the first reaction table for NPCs. This reaction table can be modified by the loyalty base as a sort of house rule. That's what we did when we play tested this. There were lots of house rules back in the day. From what I understand, again, playing with some of the Greybeards at, uh, at these cons, I highly recommend hitting North Texas if you can. The Long Con in Longview is pretty much the only reason to go to Longview. I, I can say that. I was born there. But um, going to the, some of these cons, rubbing elbows with the elder gamers, and listening to the stories of what it was like. Fascinating. Discussion of capturing monsters, even all the way back in this very first version of D&D. &D. You didn't always have to kill the monster. Creativity was often rewarded by referees. So you have your loyalty discussion. And there's already a rule here, because death was rampant in these early versions of D&D, &D, for how to designate a relative to inherit your stuff when your character bites the big one. And again, zero hit points was zero hit points at this point in time. So equipment and equipment costs. Here's the original equipment list. Armor is ridiculously cheap in this version of D&D. &D. And there's a fair amount of equipment, not as much as we run into in AD&D &D and later versions, but enough to keep things interesting. I took special note of the fact that not only are horses listed in this early uh, this early version, but also boats, merchant ships, galleys. That supposes that it wasn't all about dungeons. And it wasn't. If you talk to some of these uh, older players, you will find out that there was quite a bit of wilderness travel in some ways. And some rumors that I've heard, but have not been able to really... Uh, get corroborated in person, but I've read plenty of things, um, anecdotes about it, is that the campaigns sort of ran in real time. And the time that passed between game sessions passed in the campaign. At least this is how I've heard Gary Gygax ran his campaigns. Anybody who knows for sure one way or the other, please comment. The load your character was carrying was not calculated in pounds. It was calculated by the encumbrance of coins. Because of course you're expected to delve into dungeons and come out with as many coins as you can carry. So the coin became the measure of encumbrance. Not just weight, but how cumbersome, how difficult to carry, how bulky things were. So everything is measured in numbers of coin. Here is something that is going to look very interesting to modern D&D &D players. This is the list of levels and experience points necessary to gain the levels. Notice there are no level numbers. Each class, at each level, had a title. Those titles could be used in-game to give your character and the NPCs around them and everyone else an idea of how powerful your character is without explicitly referencing a level number. You know someone who has the title of Village Priest is an established cleric with a few adventures under their belt 
two of the important ones are hero and superhero. Those are important for several reasons. As we discussed in Chainmail, there are things, specifically fantastic creatures, that a normal human has no hope at all of harming. It takes a hero or a superhero to even get onto the table that gives you the numbers necessary to harm those creatures. So the ver veteran, the warrior, the swordsman don't really have a whole lot of chance to defeat those kind of creatures. Actually, the swordsman is sometimes given a fighting value of hero minus one, in which case you do have a chance, but at a one point penalty on the 2d6 roll. We'll get into that. But here is the original set. Note that elves and dwarves already have level limits. And while there is no explicit upper limit, this is as far as the tables go. So one could infer from the way it's written that this was sort of the expected length of a Dungeons and Dragons career. And once a character reached the top, the pinnacle of these lists, then it was either time to start a new character or the character could retire and establish a holding. Here are the statistics tables for fighting men and magic users. Notice the column dice for accumulative hits. Those are all D6s. At this point in the game, there was no different die sizes for different classes or races. It was all D6s, modified up or down. And as you can see, you don't always gain a full hit die as you go up, especially if you are not a fighter. Fighting capability. You don't have an explicit bonus. There's no attack bonus. There is no Thacko. What this is telling you to do is allow the characters to fight as if they were this type or this many miniatures in chainmail. So a veteran, first level fighter, fights as man plus one. So you take the statistics for a normal soldier and add plus one to your 2d6 roll. At second level, warrior, you get two attacks, one of which gets a plus one. At third level swordsman, you can either attack three times or you can attack once as a hero minus one. This would depend on whether or not you were fighting a large number of say orcs or goblins or whether you were fighting a single fantastic creature that really needed that heroic edge to damage. A hero fights as a hero, and so forth. Magic users move up much, much more slowly. And you'll see that there is an entry for wizard. So a wizard, by title, actually fights a bit better than a hero, but not quite as good as a superhero. So you reach wizard level and you've got a fair amount of melee ability, but you probably won't need to use it because at that point you've got a ridiculous number of spells comparatively. Now, just like every other version of D&D most of us have played, the wizard begins, or sorry, magic user, begins with only one spell per adventure slash day and crawls upward from there. But once you have established yourself, started to gain spells of higher levels, you become something much more powerful. One of the big changes from Chainmail to here is if you remember, the text of Chainmail seemed to imply that the wizard could throw a missile attack every single round and could choose between lightning bolt and fireball. And there was never a mention of them running out of those. 
Lightning Bolt and Fireball have now become explicit spells and are accounted for in the spells per day. And then we've got Clerics. In this version, Clerics do not gain a casting ability until second level. They sort of have to prove themselves to their deities. And they do gain fighting ability slightly faster than the magic user. The discussion of experience points, discussion of levels, and it does say there's no theoretical level limit as to how high you can go. It explains how hit dice work and how fighting capability works in the context of chainmail. Explanation of spells and levels, how to extrapolate for higher level casters. But then we get to the alternative combat system. This is for people that don't have chainmail or don't want to use chainmail. And this is the great grandparent of the Dungeons and Dragons we play today. Whether you are a hardcore first edition player or whether you're playing fifth edition, it all goes back to this chart. Remember that in Chainmail, armor class was explicitly a class of armor. It wasn't a simple numerical progression as it is today, where a bonus to armor class either raises your AC by one point if you're playing a modern version of D&D, or lowers it by one point if you're playing a pre-2000 version of D&D or a retro clone that uses descending armor class. We're used to dexterity bonuses straight up modifying your armor class up or down in a linear numeric fashion. That was not what Chainmail did. The armor classes were numbered for convenience, but not because they were an explicit progression. Remember the Chainmail tables do not progress in a linear fashion. Different weapons are rated to hit different types of armor more or less easily. And you cannot really predict where that next number is going to be if you're reading the chart left to right. You have to look it up. So what we're used to, which began here with the alternative combat system turns armor class into a progression where each armor class is 5% less likely to be struck on a roll of a d20 than the armor class before it in numeric order. So an unarmored human in original D&D would be armor class 9. 8 holding a shield, 7 leather armor, 6 leather and shield, 5 chainmail, and so forth, down to armor class 2. At this point, dexterity will not affect armor class. And here's the number of dice, or here's the numbers needed to roll on a 20-sided die to hit. The Monster Matrix will look very familiar to any version of Dungeons & Dragons pre-2000. The Saving Throw Matrix, this is back when saving throws were given pretty specific categories. Rather than being a Dexterity save or a Strength save or a Constitution save like they are today, they were categorized. Death Ray or Poison was one. Wands polymorph and paralyzation, turn to stone, dragon breath, staves and spells. Different classes had different values and they progressed at different rates. So here are the very first spell tables. A lot of these spells carry over from chainmail and a lot of them are still present in Dungeons and Dragons today. 
this is sort of one of those sacred cow things from D&D way back. It just wouldn't be D&D without some of these spells in the list. As you can see, there's not an overabundance of spells. Not like some of the spell lists we have today. Or even in AD&D, which came out um, between 1977 and 1979. So wizard spells, magic user spells, only went up to 6th level at this point. Clerical spells only go up to 5th level, because remember, clerics have a 1 level gap where they don't cast at all. But clerics do get the ability to turn undead. And this table, again, will look very much like every turn undead table all the way up through the tail end of 2nd edition. With the T's being an automatic turn, the D's being a destroy. And later versions of the game added variations on that so that you could turn or destroy extra large numbers of given undead. Something else to note is unlike some versions of D&D, the T is monsters are turned up to two dice in number. So you roll 2d6... We're assuming D6, but 2D6 is what you use to roll on this table. So you roll 2D6, and that's how many of that monster are turned or destroyed. Rather than some versions of D&D, where that's the number of hit dice of monsters turned or destroyed, which can have a drastic effect on, an, on how much you're doing with that turn undead. Here's the explanations of spells. There is a definite favorite spell missing from the first level list. And just because I don't remember if it was missing or not, I'm going to go back a couple pages. Nope, it's not there. No magic missile. And for that matter... No acid arrow at level two. Interesting. But there's an explanation of how the spells worked at this early version of D&D. Note that spell ranges are done in inches because they're still assuming that you're playing on a tabletop with miniatures. There's some of the early artwork. Yay, the topless Amazon. Contact higher plane was always fun. The better the plane you contacted, the more your chance of getting the information you want, and then you'll just go insane. Call of Cthulhu ain't got nothing on oh, zero E, D, and D. I don't know why that elf looks a little bit more like a dwarf to me. Magical research was already a thing in Zero E. So you are invited to try to create new spells, maybe make magic items. You just have to clear it with your referee and spend a ridiculous amount of gold. And that's the end of the Men and Magic book. At least the modern day reprint thereof. So, a couple of the things that I wanted to mention about this version of Dungeons and Dragons. Hit points and weapon damage. Weapon damage was always D6. Hit points and weapon damage were sort of a different animal from what we're used to now. Nowadays, we're used to your hit points go up when you level. Different weapons do different amounts of damage. 
but remember, at this point, when uh, this game was published, the only close predecessor is Chainmail. And the Chainmail table, these are the numbers necessary to kill the figure you're firing at. You either drop them or not. There is no wounding. When you add hit points as a layer to this process, then what you're doing is making your characters almost supernaturally more resilient than the average soldier. Imagine for a moment that you're an early adopter of D&D. You're using Chainmail, and you call pretty much every standard soldier on the field, you're, you're treating them as normal man, normal human being. They're going to roll 2d6 against these numbers with no bonuses whatsoever. They're going to get one attack per round, and if they are hit, they are killed. But even a wizard with only a d6 hit points now has a chance to survive a death blow. So someone hits them with the sword, does 1d6 damage. That wizard has the opportunity, if they rolled fairly on their hit die and their attacker rolled low, to survive a blow that would kill a normal human. So even though the death toll in early versions of D&D looks egregious to modern players, especially people who've grown up on 5e now that it's been around for 10 years, there's a lot of players out there who've never played any other version of D&D, and it is notoriously difficult to permanently dirt nap a character in 5e. Now, before before I start sounding like a a you know ancient grognard, I love old school D&D. I also love playing 5e with my younger friends. I don't have a problem with their style of D&D because they are walking into the game looking for a story which was a different approach than what these early versions of D&D were. We sort of learned along the way that the story was awesome, but that wasn't the assumption walking in. You wanted to go into the dungeon, grab some treasure, kick some ass. If your character died, you rolled up a new one and tried again. Uh, again, there's rules in here for rolling up your cousin or your brother or your child and they get to pick up some of your equipment and pay 10% to the tax man and go back in and keep adventuring. That was how the story continued in older versions of D&D until the shift in player attitudes. And sometimes that happened group to group. I have no doubt there were game groups in the mid to late 70s that started weaving stories. But that's not how the game was originally written. So, getting back to my original point, the way hit points work, and the fact that weapons now do variable damage at all, makes adventurers that much more special than the average soldier. Even a first level adventurer is a cut above the standard trooper figurine that's going to be in your army. So, before your modern player looks back and scoffs at the fact that you only have 1d6 hit points and all the weapons do the same amount of damage, well, not if you're using chainmail. There's a, a phrase that is used by people that play modern multiplayer online RPGs, DPS, damage per second. Your damage per second is figured out by looking at the average amount of damage that you can do over a period of time, divide that by a number of seconds, and you come up with DPS. Think about that as damage per round using this chainmail table. You're only doing D6 every time you hit, but the important part becomes how often do you hit? So 
someone with the morning star is worth more in a fight against people wearing chain mail or banded mail or splint mail than someone wielding the sword because that morning star will hit on a seven. The sword needs to roll a nine. So the average damage per round for the person wielding the morning star is going to be higher. You don't need a different size die to do that. You just need to be using this more interesting chart that makes different weapons better or worse against different armor. This was how the game was written, but not how the game ended up being played. The D20 progression was just so much easier. But the D20 progression also lost some of this granularity. The weapons became very samey. Once we get to AD&D and we discuss that, there is a table for weapons versus armor in 1st edition AD&D. It was not used really often, and sometimes when it was used, because dexterity did affect armor class, it was used incorrectly. What should have happened was the dexterity modifier should have been applied to the D20 rather than actually altering armor class, because if you're playing that way and you're using that table, when you alter the armor class, you're altering the effectiveness of the weapon against that armor, not just making it harder to hit someone. In fact, you might make it easier, depending on what weapon you're using against what armor. So I guess where I'm going with this is I really appreciate the original way this was written. I love this chainmail table. I love the 2d6 resolution. I love the fact that characters gain multiple attacks very quickly because they are literally as good on the battlefield as multiple soldiers. This is sort of like the epic scene at the end of Fellowship of the Ring where you get to see what someone like Aragorn or Boromir is really capable of in combat. And then when Legolas and Gimli arrive, you get to see how effective they are in combat. The orcs drop like flies because the heroes are making what is more or less multiple attacks. That's how this would play on the tabletop. A hero, a character of fourth level as a fighting man or fighter, would be able to swing four times in a round as long as they weren't trying to hit something that is a mythical creature, a fantastic creature, and therefore appearing on that table. So if you're not fighting a ring wraith, you're going to be beating the crap out of multiple enemy soldiers or orcs or goblins or what have you. So D&D, as written, perhaps not as played, was a very different game than we look at now. In fact, it was more different than most people think because you do see the bones of modern D&D in this book. But a lot of it is where you're looking at that alternate combat system, which if you believe the, game, the way the game is written rather than the way the game was played, um, that alternate combat system um, was never meant to be the stock combat system. The stock combat system was meant to be these values. The ability of these characters to attack as, like a Myrmidon attacks as six soldiers. That's just an incredible mental picture. Seeing that character walk into a crowd and start to wade through the bad guys. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. All right. Well, that wraps it up for tonight. Thank you for joining us back on the Old Dragoon. We're going to, again, try to drop every second Monday. Sometimes life gets in the way. But we're working on it. So, did anything in this video strike you as interesting? Was there anything I went over that you didn't know? Because nowadays, there's so many great books out there and websites and podcasts about the history of the game. Gaming archaeology like this tends to keep turning up the same the same pieces of information, right? It's already out there. It's already been studied. You know, people like Ben Riggs and Shannon Applecline 
um, and John Peterson have really gone out of their way to make all these things accessible. So let me know in the comments if there's anything you found interesting or anything you want me to dig deeper in when we get to book two. Our next video will be another role-playing game outside the D&D line. And then the video after that, we will be getting back to book two and moving forward in the Zero E progression. This has been The Old Dragoon. And remember, character is what you are in the dark. Good night, everybody.